Hey, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, as you folks are entering into the uh, webinar here, uh, I just want to make sure you can all hear me. So if you could be so kind for those listening, if uh, you, you see a chat uh, button on the bottom of your screen, just enter in the chat, say good morning, hello. Uh, let us know who you are, where you're listening in from this morning. I just want to, again, make sure that you can hear us um, on this beautiful Wednesday morning. Uh, so thank you. So on be as we get started here, on behalf of the uh, Bridgeport Regional Business Council and our Government Relations Committee, um, I just wanted to welcome you all this morning. I know um, we're all probably a little bit zoomed out um, with um, just the, the, the way the past year has been, um, but I wanted to make sure that we had this opportunity to bring some of our elected officials together for just a wrap up of the legislative session. I know um, you know, it, was a, it was a difficult, or not just difficult, but just a different kind of session this year with uh, not being allowed up in Hartford. Um, so I appreciate uh, uh, the folks that uh, joined us this morning um, for this wrap up and of course our elected officials for all the work that they've done um, over the course of the, this, this particular session. So I think we have a, a good conversation lined up for you just to give an update on, on what happened up in Hartford and perhaps how uh, it is uh, going to be impacting um, business going forward. You know, I often say that our government relations and advocacy work that we do through the government relations committee uh, is one of the most important activities that we do at the BRBC. Um, we all know the importance of good sound public policy and its, in, and its impact on the economy and the vitality of the communities that we serve. So it's gatherings like today uh, to bring the business community together with our elected officials uh, to discuss the important re relevant issues that continue to foster um, a healthy and thriving economy. So um, for me, uh, this is a great conversation um, to have. And yeah, these things don't happen on their own. Um, again, I mentioned the Government Relations Committee. Uh, I just want to acknowledge our co-chairs, Al Carbone from UI uh, uh, Holding Company and Greg Dancho from uh, the Beardsley Zoo. Uh, again, this session was a little bit different. Uh, so what we did was we tried to leverage our relationship with the CBIA, the, the Connecticut Business Industry Association, and moderating today's panel will be Ashley Zane. And I just want a, a hat tip to them. Um, they've done a great job uh, this session, just keeping all of us informed, my colleagues across the state, the business community, um, advocating for, uh, for the businesses and the business community in general. Uh, I thought they did a great job, especially with, again, the limited access to Hartford. Um, so uh, I just appreciate that relationship and all they've done uh, on behalf of business uh, here in the greater Bridgeport region. And then, of course, our two sponsors today, uh, AT&T and Cohen and Wolf. Uh, thank you for their ongoing support in, in our work here around uh, public policy. Uh, and with that, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Kelly Batucci. Um, she is the Regional Director of External and Legislative Affairs for AT&T here in Connecticut. She's a 25-year veteran of the company. Uh, Kelly has held several positions in various divisions, including network delivery, operations, sales, project management, training, marketing, and wireless. In her current role, Kelly is responsible for advancing the legislative and regulatory agenda for the company and state government, and of course, community relations. Um, I just want to make mention that Kelly is a board member of the BRBC and is an active participant on, in those conversations as well again, related to our government relations work that we do um, here at the Business Council and our three chambers. So with that, I'd like to welcome Kelly for some opening remarks uh, and opening comments and uh, as we uh, get started here with the program. Good morning, Kelly. Good to have you here this morning. Good morning, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, I, in particular, would like to thank our uh, legislative delegation. Um, it's been a long session. It's been a lot different than what we're used to. Um, and I, uh, in particular, have had the opportunity to uh, both talk to Steve and Dave at, at various points throughout you know, the session and, uh, and grateful for the fact that they were able to find time despite a very different way of doing things um, to still um, allow all of us to have our voices heard um, and uh, make sure that they understood the impact of uh, various pieces of legislation on our businesses. So AT&T is uh, very pleased and proud um, to be a sponsor of today's event and would um, like to also thank CBIA for their partnership um, 
I'll be introducing Ashley Zane uh, from CBIA. Ashley is a government affairs associate and uh, has responsibility for representing the Connecticut business, Connecticut businesses um, at the state, um, particularly around budget and spending, higher education, environment, and commerce related issues. Um, prior to CBIA, uh, Ashley was a policy analyst for the House Republican Office, um, and she covered committees um, like the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee, the Appropriations Committee, and Commerce. Um, Ashley earned her MPA at the University of Connecticut and also holds a bachelor's degree from uh, the University of Connecticut. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ashley, um, who will be facilitating our panel discussion this morning. Thank you so much. Hi, thanks so much, Kelly, and thanks again for having me. Again, my name is Ashley Zane. I'm a government affairs associate with CBIA. And this morning, we're joined with Representative Staffstrom, Representative Vertigliano, and Representative Baker. So why don't we start with Representative Stra Staffstrom, give a 10-second intro, and maybe one of the initiatives that you worked on this session. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us. I'm Steve Stastrom. I'm the state representative for the 129th district, which is the uh, western part of Bridgeport, the Black Rock, Brooklawn, West End areas. Uh, I am also the House Chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Um, and certainly it was a very busy session, particularly on the uh, Judiciary Committee side uh, with substantial criminal justice reform, uh, domestic violence, prevention initiatives, um, uh, just yesterday finalizing the, uh, or the signing of the bill on recreational cannabis, uh, and a number of, of, of other bills that, uh, that came through the Judiciary Committee this year. Great, and Representative Vertigliano? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, hit the video, not the mute. Um, my name is David Tigliano. I'm the state representative from Trumbull's 123rd district. I'm the ranking member on the general law committee. I sit on the labor committee, regulations review, and I'm a whip in the house. Um, you know, listen, it was a busy session. It was odd to not have anybody up there. We spent the majority of our time trying to stop the countless number of bad ideas that came through the legislature. Great, thanks. And Representative Baker? Oh, and you're still on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? All good. Oh, okay, I'm Representative Andre Baker. I represent the, the 124th District, which is um, the East End of Bridgeport part of the East Side, the Mill Hill and uh, Success Park. Um, I sit on the Appropriations Committee, Banking, and, and um, P&D, which is um, um, Planning and Development. And yes, this has, was a very busy session and a very emotional one for a lot of us. Thanks. So we did get a couple questions from the Public Policy uh, Committee here. And one of the first questions was, um, what is one of the most impactful initiatives that passed this year for small businesses, um, whether it be um, the Office of Workforce Strategies or increasing the R&D tax credit. Um, in your opinion, what's the most impactful? And we'll start with Representative Vertigliano. Uh, you know, I I don't know actually what we've done to, to I mean, I really, we stopped a bunch of stuff that would have been very harmful to small business this year. Some of the predicting scheduling measures, some of the other things. We thought that uh, although the governor did put and the legislator did put some money into the unemployment trust fund from the, uh, the, the uh, COVID money, we thought that a lot more should be put in there uh, down the road that all that money we borrowed from the federal government is going to have to be paid back and it, and it will be paid back by existing businesses. So, um, I'm sorry, that's all I have, but that's all I have. And Representative Baker. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, my, my, my hands are too big for my, 
Uh, I'm not sure in terms of how uh, some of this legislation is really, really going to have an impact on the, on the businesses, but I know that a lot of the things that we did in trying to um, um, establish legislation to, to be able to really get people back in uh, working and, and to try to change the dynamics of, of Connecticut itself to um, just kind of open the door to get more um, small businesses um, here in Connecticut. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the big, um, big bam, um, larger corporations and everything. I think if we really establish some policies to help small businesses get jump started, you know, 30, 40 um, employees and, and from a community perspective, I think that that's what a lot of the policies really tried to help and to get people in the, in the communities back to work and, and, and to um, get small businesses in those areas, the opportunity to employ uh, um, people in the community and stuff. I think those are the things that um, have a domino effect. You know, if you have um, small businesses in your, in your community and you have um, community um, people that are work there, those, those dollars will, will stay within that community. So, um, you know, I look forward to see how the, uh, some of these policies uh, that were um, passed um, help these small businesses as time goes on. Great, thanks. And Representative Sastrom? So I, I think obviously it has to start with the top line, um, which is in, you know, certainly any long legislative session like we're in, the, our primary job or, or goal or function is to pass a biennium state budget. And I think passing a, um, a, a bipartisan state budget, only the second one that's been passed in, in you know, quite some time in Connecticut, um, that avoided any sort of major revenue enhancements that actually will allow us to pay down um, over a billion dollars in long-term liability. Um, you know, we know that governors, both Democrat and Republican and legislators over the course of decades have underfunded our, our debt obligations. And the fact that we're not just making good on 100% of that obligation, but in fact, paying down a significant um, a chunk of, of long-term debt obligation this year is, is huge. Um, I think certainly for Bridgeport small businesses in particular, the fact that this budget um, funds a new pilot program, which uh, pumps an additional $16 million a year in state aid uh, into the city of Bridgeport, which between that and, um, uh, and re the revaluation allowed uh, Bridgeport to drastically cut its mill rate uh, this year, um, and particularly uh, the tax cut that you're going to see on commercial property in the city of Bridgeport um, is, is critical to um, uh, allowing uh, small business in, in Bridgeport in particular to grow and thrive uh, in the years to come. Great, and thank you all for those answers. Um, another thing that we're starting to see is a shift towards focusing on advanced manufacturing, um, especially in this area. Was there any talk in the legislature about how to improve the climate for that sector? And we'll start with Representative Baker. So I wasn't I wasn't pretty much on up to up to speed in, in, in terms of um, how that and even given any kind of thought and in, in terms of being able to um, uh, take down that initiative. But one of the things that I I I, I, I did um, speak to um, um, so for instance Goodwin College. I haven't had some dialogue with them. They've actually. Uh, um, integrated into the University of Bridgeport. And I've had some conversations with them in, in terms of what we can do to actually get into the community, community into the school system to bring that, that, that technical um, aspect that they've done so well with up in the Hartford area and to work with some of these small businesses uh, and to bring um, in apprentice programs um, to Bridgeport and also some of the surrounding towns um, work with some of the schools that, that we can get some of these youth that, 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 that have the gifts, the talents and have the, um, the knowledge and wanted to get into the, the technical uh, um, job. So um, that was some good conversation and, and I think that that would be an excellent start 
to be able to grow small businesses and, and to have that workforce um, here in the Fairfield County area, um, like they do up in the, uh, the Northeast and the Northwest parts of, of, of Connecticut. Because as I said earlier in my conversation, I believe that um, small businesses are the key to the growth of, of Connecticut. And as we see that, um, that, that market of, um, of, of housing exploding, um, here in the Connecticut area, you have people coming from New York and I'm sure they will get tired of that commute. And if we're able to, to, to bring these, uh, these small businesses up to speed and, and with these apprentice programs, we will see um, these people that are um, actually commuting back and forth from New York that have brought the houses here, stay here in Connecticut. And, and that will be the growth of our, our business sector here in Connecticut. Great, thanks. And Representative Vertigliano, you sit on the Labor Committee. So any particular insights from that perspective? Well, not advanced manufacturing. I didn't have any bills that referred to advanced manufacturing come before uh, any of my committees. Uh, I will say that in general, especially the Greater Bridgeport Area Delegation, myself included, are very supportive of Housatonic University and uh, Community College and their uh, advanced manufacturing program. I, I do think it's important that we make that available to as many people as we can for as low as cost as we can. So I know I speak for the other two representatives that we're all pretty supportive of, uh, of their initiative, so. Great, thanks. And Representative Staffstrom? Yeah, the only thing I would add is, I, you know, I think we've seen time and again that, that our issue in Connecticut right now with advanced manufacturing in particular is not a shortage of jobs, it's a shortage of skilled folks to fill those jobs in our state. Um, and so I think uh, certainly one of the things that this budget did this year was fund additional dollars for workforce development. I know um, Joe Carbone and the workplace couldn't, couldn't join us today, but I know he in particular is, is very pleased um, with how this budget turned out uh, and, and some of the funding to go into that. Um, certainly with, uh, you know, investments in Housatonic Community College, with um, the investment that Goodwin University is making uh, at the University of Bridgeport campus. And, you know, we're really hoping fits and starts that uh, the new Bassick High School project uh, gets off the ground sooner rather than later because a big focus of that uh, program in Bridgeport will be to um, allow high school students to to get a, a broader focus on advanced manufacturing as well. Um, about 25% of the seats in that high school are supposed to be geared towards that. So um, the initiatives are there. Um, it's just a matter of continuing to build that pipeline of, of skilled work and skilled labor to, to fill those jobs. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, you know, and you had a lot of big ticket, big high profile issues come up this year, including uh, recreational cannabis. And there are some employers who do have some concerns um, about workplace protection. So um, Representative Staffstrom, how about you start us out on what um, employers can expect from this bill? Yeah, so um, obviously we are far from the first state who has legalized recreational cannabis. We're 19th in the country, including a number of our neighboring states. Um, and so, whereas a lot of times on, on issues, Connecticut is at or near the top and leading on some of these issues, this is one where we followed um, and we, we looked at what has worked and what has not worked in, in surrounding states. And, um, you know, I, I, in, as one of the principal authors of this bill, you know, I can say that, um, you know, having looked at the legislation in other states, I believe we have the strongest or, or one of the strongest um, work employer protection bills uh, that has passed anywhere in the country. Uh, employers are still able to maintain drug-free workplaces. You have uh, absolutely no obligation as an employer to allow um, your employees to, to use or, or smoke or consume cannabis uh, on your property or even outside of the workplace, um, as long as you post a policy on that and Certainly, um, you know, I'm happy to talk offline with, with folks on, on that issue and, and the promulgation of the policy, but you need to just promulgate a policy and you can maintain a drug-free workplace. Also, there are a number of what's called exempt employees spelled out under the bill. Police, firefighters, any EMT, medical professionals, anybody with a um, 
uh, CDL driver's license, uh, anyone who needs federal security clearance, uh, the list goes on and on. And those folks are specifically prohibited from uh, using cannabis uh, as, as spelled out in the bill. So, uh, you know, as I've often said, just because cannabis is quote unquote legal in Connecticut as of um, July 1st does not mean that everyone in the state is going to be able to uh, go out and use it. Um, and so I think, um, you know, certainly uh, as this rolls out and as, as employers get get familiar and comfortable with it, I don't see this being a, a major change. And in fact, one of the things that's initiated in this bill is, is beyond just cannabis is an update or a rewrite of our Clean Air Act in Connecticut. You know, a lot of folks don't realize that kind of the old 1990s um, rules about employers over a certain time having to require, having to provide smoking lounges in their uh, places of employment. That stuff maintained, was still on the books in many respects. People ignored it, but, but those requirements were still on the books. Um, those requirements have been removed under this bill. Uh, employers are now able to designate their entire grounds as, as smoke-free, so smoke-free campus. Um, including, you know, outside of the physical building if, if they so choose under this bill. Uh, and not just for cannabis, but for tobacco as well. Uh, so I, you know, I think actually um, we took we took a lot of time and a lot of attention to make sure we addressed the concerns uh, of our business community in, in crafting this legislation. Great, thanks. And Representative Tigliano, as a business owner yourself, what insights uh, do you have after reading the bill? <laughs> uh, it's the good representative. I can disagree on the, the legalization of marijuana. I am against the commercialization of marijuana. I think this is going to lead to a lot of unintended public health and other consequences in society. I don't think it's a very good bill. I think it opens the door for a lot of corruption. I think it's a, it's a, it, as I keep reading the bill, it, it's a, uh, the problems in the bill are gifts that are going to keep on giving throughout time and probably will require a lot of fixing. Um, I, don't, I don't know what else to say, but uh, I, I just didn't support the measure. Uh, I, I understand decriminalization, some of the other things that people are talking about. I just wasn't in favor, me personally, of the commercialization of marijuana. So I don't know how employers are going to shake this out. I guess if you test now for drugs, I, I from what I understand, you can continue to do so. I, I read some of the smoking things in the newspaper today. Uh, I don't know who's going to enforce that. I guess the local police, I think it's up to the local police. If somebody's to measure whether they're 25 feet away from a front door of a business or something, I, I don't know how in practice that's actually going to work and how well that's going to work out for people, but we'll see what happens. Thanks. And Representative Baker? And, you know, um, I, since the end of session, and I, I've been I've been reading bits and pieces of the legislation there yeah, because it's, 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 it's well over close to 300 pages. And just to get a true understanding of it and stuff, I'll probably be reading it for the next year um, just to try to get an understanding. There's, there's so many moving pieces. And, and, and one of my concerns is that, you know, people, you know, they, they, they read the newspaper that they hear, oh, it's legal. They're going to run with it. And where are we going to do our education? Where are we going to get to the true enforcement and getting the understanding of people here, the guidelines and stuff. And then you're just going to get so many people that are just going to just try to push it to the limits. Um, you know, it, it passed. Um, I didn't vote in favor of it, but it passed, and and I, and and that's the will of the uh, of the the legislation and the majority, and and I'm 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 going to be working with uh, each and every one of it so that we can make sure that, that the information gets out and, and people understand this is the, the the policy, this is the law, and, and and this is how we have to follow it to to make this thing work, and uh, so um, you know. I just look forward to continuing, you know, in, in, in terms of, you know, as a business owner myself, you know, a lot of concern to me is that, you know, how do you articulate uh, um, these policies and, and I have to um, 
um, agree with the um, the representative from Trumbull. It's like you know, how do you police this? You know, uh, um, in terms of um, with the police, you know, uh, um, labor and, and and dealing with your employees, uh, you know, that want to be users of this um, cannabis product. So um, you know, we do still continue to have some work that needs to be done. And as I said, education is going to be important and, and continuing to be able to um, present the, um, the policy as a whole. Great, thanks everyone again. What was an initiative that you had this legislative session? Um, what happened with it? What was your number one priority? And we'll start with you, Representative Ritigliano. You know, I, I'm pretty direct and uh, I try not to be vague in, in a lot of things, I, but you know, we're only a couple of weeks past session and I have to admit that I work on so many things that by the end of the year, I'm sure Representative Stasham has the same problem. They all sort of, uh, I have a hard time remembering the bills I put in at the beginning, but uh, some of the things we definitely worked on this year was, uh, uh, I did a lot of work on liquor laws again this year, but I also had a, a big pharmacy bill that I worked on with Senator Maroney from Milford. And part of that pharmacy bill was that in methadone right now isn't included in the drug prescription drug monitoring program in Connecticut. So we actually added that to the program because we have found over time that some people may be either A, abusing methadone or somebody who's in treatment who has an injury or an accident can go to a hospital and be prescribed the wrong pain medication and sort of hurt their recovery. So I know I worked on a, a lot of things, but I, there are a couple of things that I was proud of and, and that was one of them. That's great. And Representative Baker? Yeah. I didn't have any, 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 any particular bills that I presented and stuff. I, you know, one of the bills that I was really uh, a champion of and working um, hard on is, was the, the equity funding, which is um, equity, um, um, helping to jumpstart um, um, uh, minority communities and stuff um, with um, infrastructure and, and services, um, you know, the, uh, the PPRC. Uh, um, caucus that was on one of our, our, our bills that we were working on and you know just to kind of like I mean as you look at this the last um, year and a half two years and stuff and how what the impact of this pandemic has has created um, not you know uh, all over the um, the country but you know especially in, in, in black and brown communities and stuff and we wanted to make sure that we we were able to um, open the door so that they could have funding to get, uh, uh, um, you know, just a jump start on um, any any businesses, any programs, of housing, uh, uh, you know, just you know. And I take Bridgeport for example. I mean, we have so many uh, uh, um, um, brownfields. We have so many um, vacant lots, abandoned uh, 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 warehouses where we could utilize those for businesses, uh, um, housing, and stuff. So we wanted to make sure that that we that we um, set up this 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 funding so that we could um, build our communities back up. And um, and we were successful with that, you know. A lot of the bills, and I have to, I, I just have to, you know, give a, a shout out to a Representative Stastrom. You know, I, I know his legs are tired because he he stood up there and he fought for a lot of um, equity uh, um, bills, and I appreciate what he, what he did and, and gave his all and all to that. Um, we um, this session for me, when I say it was emotional, it was really geared for the people and trying to help people that had uh, that had stumbled, fought, fell down, and they need a helping hand get back up. Uh, um, you know, to be able to say, hey, the state is here to help you get back on your feet, get your education, finish, you know, uh, um, high school, um, give you a jump start, the college degrees or, or, or technical uh, uh, um, jobs so that you can um, become a, um, a, um, a productive um, and uh, um, important um, person that will add back to society, um, build, help build your community back up and be a product, uh, be a stakeholder in your community and stuff. Um, 
you know, we in the banking, we, we passed the, the, the bill that um, that for first home time buyers, uh, um, and, you know, to kind of um, help with some of the, um, the policies with some of the local banks to help people, you know, buy these homes and because it shouldn't just be people that uh um, that are buying a house that have come up from from new york or out of state to um to buy these homes but it should people right here what can we do to establish to help them to buy their uh, um those homes that are, have been in their family for years to keep these these these, these traditional lines and, and especially have young people uh, so you know i you know i'm very happy that those those, those um, legislations uh, were passed because it's, it's all about the um, building Connecticut back up, but doing something for the people that are here and that have lived here all of their lives and want to continue to live here because we have so many people, especially young people, they finish school, they go to college and then outside and they stay in those communities and they invest in those communities. We need to have them come back and continue to invest into the growth of, of Connecticut. And Representative Sastrom? So I think um, in addition to what we talked about, certainly as, as Judiciary Chair, you know, we, we touch a lot of things that come through our committee. Um, you know, obviously there was significant uh, rework of our domestic violence laws. There was um, uh, work on, on gun legislation. There was uh, there was certainly some pandemic response, some streamlining of our court process and, and some codification of the governor's executive orders, including uh, the one that allows corporations in the state to hold their, um, uh, their board and, and shareholder meetings remotely. Um, but I think one of the things uh, certainly that, that I think drew a lot of, sort of media attention this year and, and really um, was kind of historic about this session was the amount of criminal justice reform um, we did. I think it was certainly a year that um, not really not much of the penal code didn't get touched in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, and I know that's probably not something we normally dwell on with a with a business audience, but I I, I would be remiss if I didn't um, make a plug for the work we did on the clean slate legislation this year. Um, you know, I, it, this is a bill that will allow uh, misdemeanor convictions to be erased after seven years and uh, certain low level felony convictions to be erased after 10 years. Um, and, you know, if you look at particularly picking up on Representative Baker's point about coming out of an urban center, coming out of a, uh, a traditionally uh, repressed community in the state, um, we know that when folks get a clean slate, when they get their records erased, uh, within one year, their earning potential, their their earnings, um, increase by about 22%. Um, that lifts families out of poverty. It it helps uh, children um, live better productive lives when the parents get given a, a clean slate. Um, it really advances society in so many ways. And you know, we've looked at studies and statistics out of Michigan and, and Pennsylvania, in particular, who passed similar type of legislation. Uh, and if you extrapolate out the um, growth in the economy, we can see by having this erasure and allowing folks to, who may not have been eligible for advanced manufacturing job, but all of a sudden now they are because that low level conviction that's been chasing them for years uh, is off their resume and, and can, can advance into that uh, manufacturing job. Um, we've seen statistics that show this legislation could increase our GDP by a billion dollars a year. Um, I'm not sure of a bill we passed this session or in any other session um, that has the potential to create that much growth in our GDP uh, as the clean slate legislation did this year. So, you know, I think that's one that I'm, I'm probably most proud of um, that passed this legislative session. And I think uh, certainly was controversial at the time. I see Representative Vertigliano looking at me, but, uh, at the, but at the same time, I think history will prove uh, on that, that it, it was the right policy for the state of Connecticut and, and will lead to um, uh, economic growth for the state in the long run. Yeah, I know we're not supposed to debate, and uh, I, I want the representative to know that I, I actually support his initiatives uh, with the second chance. I firmly believe, and many people do that, if somebody fully serves their sentence, that they should be able to reintegrate in society and be able to live and work and do everything. 
the bill just had a couple of things that went a little too far. I just wanted to let him know that. And that's where some of the pushback came from. Um, but the general principle, I am in full support because I listen, somebody does the crime, they pay the penalty. It doesn't mean they have to be sentenced for the rest of their life. They should be able to work, live, be able to get housing. So I, I really do support it. Uh, the general concept. There was a couple of stuff in there, especially the stuff on the uh, the 364 that sort of just bothered me on a different level. And it, it did raise some uh, stuff. But I wanted to let them know that I, I think in, for the most part, it was a pretty good initiative. I appreciate that. I think the uh, every now and again, there's those bills in the General Assembly. You wish you didn't have a green button and a red button. You actually had like a yellow button that would say, you know, I'm I'm not voting for this, but I'm also not necessarily opposed to it either. So it sounds sounds like you would have been a yellow button on this one, Dave. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, I was for ban the box. I'm for a lot of that stuff. I really think people got to live their lives if they, you know, if they serve their time, if they paid the price. I believe people should be able to live their life to be blunt. So. Well, I think we can put in a new bill for a yellow button in the next session. I think that could be something to look at. And we're also joined by Representative Gresco as well. So what was an initiative that you had this year? Um, and a quick 10 second intro. Um, well, the, 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 the successful passing of the uh, uh, modernization of the uh, bottle bill, which uh, had been for decades been, been uh, uh, languishing uh, uh, in, in the uh, General Assembly. Um, we, we modernized it. We uh, upped the handling fee for, for um, uh, redemption centers and for grocery stores. And uh, we are also going to expand the, the, the product. Uh, uh, we're pushing it out a couple of years to give the industry a chance to wrap their brains around what's coming. We also are going to a dime. Um, in a couple of years, uh, and hopefully the states around us will see that we are going to a dime so that they will they will follow suit. Um, uh, and so that was a, uh, a major, um, uh, it kind of fried my brain, uh, for, for, for lack of a better term, um, um, this session and, and, and working uh, on all of the stakeholders uh, and the like. Um, uh, and then, you know, we did have uh, quite a few um, good environment bills that that, uh, that made it through um, um, some some uh, anaerobic digestion on farms, uh, what uh, gives them uh, a chance to, uh, you know, generate some some uh, cash flow by generating uh, energy. Uh, we had some um, um, uh, PFAS language in that uh, we removed the um, the uh, the. Uh, PFAS from the firefighting foam uh, to, to protect our firefighters and also uh, uh, phasing out uh, the use of PFAS on food packaging um, uh, as we go forward. Um, and then um, um, drilling down a little bit uh, uh, locally, um, you have a, a business in, in your building at 10 Middle Street, uh, uh, Colmar, and uh, I had been working on uh, um, a bill for uh, quite a few years um, for, for them, and uh, it would um, allow a, 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 slow, a slow phase in of, of a blending of uh, biodiesel in with home uh, heating oil, and uh, um, it would uh, assist that local uh, business. It would uh, uh, provide an immediate uh, lowering of the uh, um, of greenhouse gas uh, generation um, for people that that aren't going to be getting a Tesla wall or people that don't, aren't going to be getting solar, but they still have an oil burner, but now they can they can uh, uh, choose to uh, ha have a blend. So uh, and that uh, that business will hopefully um, uh, thrive uh, more here in the in the state of Connecticut, specifically uh, in Bridgeport. And uh, look, we're going to have a, a municipal, we already have a municipal solid waste crisis on us, and we're going to have to figure out uh, um, ways to um, um, uh, mitigate that going forward. Uh, it, does that mean uh, sep separating out um, uh, glass uh, from our single stream? Uh, that is uh, uh, going to be looked at by deep and the industry going forward. And um, uh, uh, we're also going to be um, allowing uh, municipalities that are interested uh, to, to, to potentially uh, start a food waste diversion or 
they can go uh, to, to unit-based pricing if they want to. Uh, it's not going to be something that's mandated from the state. It's just going to be um, uh, information and um, assistance if, if the municipality chooses to go that uh, route. So uh, I know every every um, uh, committee chair and 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 ranking member, you know, uh, believes their their committee is is the most uh, important uh, that's up there. But uh, you know, environmentally, we have to make some uh, uh, tough choices going forward, and. Um, uh, I think we had a good year this year. So, so, so thank you. Now, can I ask Joe a quick question? Joe, is it an automatic, I voted for the bill. I voted for the bill because of the NIP section in there because it's, I actually think the NIP thing is a real crisis. I mean, everywhere you go, you see these bottles everywhere. I mean, the industry and the package stores really need to, to get it together. But is it an automatic raise to 10? Or I thought there was some like uh, uh, a part of that where the industry had a couple of years to sort of come up with some new ideas or some new innovations. And then at that point, it wouldn't go to 10 if they were able to figure out how to recycle better or do a better job with their uh, with their bottles. That is the discretion of, of the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, I didn't want to have the um, I didn't want to have the um, um, I can't think of the word off the top of my head uh, um, trigger uh, in there. I wanted to have it be in there uh, as uh, as uh, it coming and it, hey if, if they come up with a uh, with a, a plan that is going to result in you know 80 to 85 percent of, of re redemption uh, rate without going to a dime and and uh, and uh, deep and and the environment committee signs off on it then god bless you but uh, uh if not, then we go to a dime. And I've already uh, um, been entertaining um, calls from individuals who uh, are interested in hosting redemption uh, centers in urban areas. And um, uh, the, as you saw in, in the implementer, there's a, a grant program that is going to be assisting with startup costs for um, or these locations, especially in urban areas. So uh, that's that's the first um, uh, phase is that, you know, every, we want everyone to recycle but and redeem, but if there's nowhere to take your your items, then you got a problem. I, I wanted to commend you on that, on that particular section because, you know, I think it's great that you guys tried to empower the industry or give them an opportunity to sort of get the redemption rates up before the hike went went there. I think they asked for it. Let's see what they come up with. But I wanted to thank you for uh, for at least including that, giving them an opportunity to do something about it. Uh, uh, well, thank you, uh, Dave. It was a tough uh, it was a tough sell. And, and look, it, it, you know, the stakeholders in all of these things. And, and uh, uh, a lot of your and my colleagues were were not happy with that the NIPs were not included in the in the um, in the uh, redemption process, but uh, the fact that the industry is willing to put the surcharge on them and then have those funds go back to the individual municipality, to me at least acknowledges the fact that they know that NIPs are a problem, and uh, so, so I'm hoping that uh, um, as I know that the uh, reverse vending machines. Uh, our uh, companies are, are, are working on technology that would allow NIPs to be redeemed um, uh, via the reverse vending machines. So that's going to be a, a, a factor in, in this going forward as well. And now you're going to see these reverse vending machines in front of um, Target and, and CVS and, and Walgreens and the like, where they should have been technically all these years. Um, they just have never done it. But now that the handling fee has been increased, it, it becomes a moneymaker for, for, for them. So now you're going to see the, the opportunity to, to, to bring your um, 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 uh, re redeemables back to where you got them from uh, and, and, and go from there. Great. So shifting focus to this environment energy conversation, um, especially down in the Bridgeport area, green technology, renewables is a really big, big issue, especially with wind. What came out of the session in terms of energy and technology side? And we'll start with you, Representative Gresco. Um, well, the, the uh, Connecticut is, is um, uh, 
considered you know the uh, a fuel cell leader uh, in, in uh, not only in the country but uh, in the world. So um, uh, there was a, a bill that um, basically said in our next uh, procurement of, of renewable energy, uh, uh, you know, f fuel cells w uh, need to to be uh, addressed. In that, uh, we have a uh, arguably one of the largest fuel cell farms. Uh, in the country in the west end of Bridgeport that is powering uh, that section uh, of the city. Um, so uh, uh, that was a, uh, a bill that was um, um, very uh, important going forward. The, the thermal loop, believe it or not, is, is still uh, uh, progressing. Uh, it, it is now um, in its last few um, uh, siting council uh, uh, hearings. Uh, going forward, and uh, um, once the, the the fuel cell for that project is, is approved, um, then um, we will uh, hopefully break ground uh, in the fall. Um, you know, it, it's just nice to see that uh, the the coal plant in Bridgeport uh, has finally been uh, decommissioned, and um, um, you know the the. Uh, you know, there's there's a concern, uh, an environmental justice concern uh, in the in the urban um, areas, uh, rightly so. And uh, um, but uh, as we as we evolve uh, this technology into a, a cleaner technology, um, going going forward, um, uh, and uh, it's just a, a combination of the, the, that technology and uh, also um, you know I've been working with United Illuminating and we are. Uh, 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 in the city of Bridgeport are, are going to be uh, doing a uh, energy efficiency, uh, uh, next round of energy efficiency upgrades, um, um, uh, lighting and, uh, and the like um, for uh, both school buildings and uh, specifically uh, for, for, for Bridgeport, our emergency operations center and um, um, the, the West End uh, water treatment facility. So um, it, it's just uh, an evolution that hopefully everyone, uh, you know, gets behind because, um, um, like I said, uh, if everybody looks uh, through, through what they do through an environmental lens, uh, it, uh, now you have time working for you as opposed to uh, working against you. So, uh, so thank you. Great, and we've got about seven minutes left or so. So if you could look through a crystal ball and see what next session is going to be, what issues do you think are gonna reemerge or what new issues do you think are gonna come up next session? And we'll start with Representative Baker. And you're still on mute. I kind of panned off for a little bit. Um, so, um, from the clear, you said that you, what are some of the things that were priorities for next session? Well, um, I, 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 I think that um, there were, um, you know, some of the things that we wanted um, that I would like to see done is, you know, some of the uh, um, the bills that are. Uh, uh, um, that haven't weren't passed, maybe we can put those things back on the agenda. Uh, some of the bills that were passed, we can start to see how some of those things are, uh, um, um, kind of pan out and what we need to implement and do those things and stuff. Um, I know next session is really, really a short session. So, um, you know, there weren't any main, main priorities and, and things of like that um, that I had um, wanted to put on the table and then see it done. And Representative Staffstrom? So, uh, you know, I think it'll be uh, interesting as we kind of get out and post COVID, um, you know, what kind of trickles up over over this off session. Um, you know, certainly there will be uh, budget adjustments. There always are, uh, but, but hopefully our revenue numbers as a state continue in the trend they've been going where uh, as we see new people and new businesses moving into Connecticut, um, you know, our, our, what was over the last five to 10 years, um, is certainly a stress on our, on our state revenue projections. Um, 
you know, knock on wood, we seem to be behind that. So uh, let's, let's hope that continues. Um, you know, Representative Tiglano is right. There will be adjustments to the cannabis legislation, uh, particularly as, um, uh, you know, that program gets up and off the ground. Um, you know, uh, but I think it'll be, um, I actually think it'll be a quieter legislative section session next year. I think a lot of the traditional kind of issues that have been hanging over the legislature, be it legalization of cannabis, be it sports gaming, um, you know, be it budgetary issues, um, seem to got dealt with this year. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe it'll actually be a little quieter session, who knows. We'll see, fingers crossed. That would be, that'd be interesting. And Representative Ritigliano? Um, I think the thing I would look forward to the most is that the building reopens, that the Capitol reopens. I, I have to say that I think the legislation got worse this year. Not worse. I'm trying to use better words. I, I just think that without the advocates in the building on both sides of the aisle, the, the legislation either got more extreme or wasn't as good as it could have been. I think that people need to be in the building and to talk to legislators, to inform us, and to answer certain questions that we have. I don't think it was a, a net positive for the Capitol to be closed as long as it was. So that's what I look forward to next year, is that a, maybe a little bit more balanced approach to things, a little bit more information. I, I, I didn't like that the Capitol wasn't bustling with people and there wasn't people talking to, and the advocates didn't have an opportunity to state their case. Um, so, that's what I think. I also think it would be great, Joe, if if we can have the conversation at some point, because this is the Bridgeport Regional Business Council, right? If even though we're all for renewables and we have to do all this stuff to, to sort of, you know, reduce greenhouse gases, all this stuff, if we can have the conversation of why it's so expensive to buy gas and electricity in Connecticut, and if we could ever have that conversation about increasing capacity, possibly an additional natural gas pipeline, we pay some of the highest natural gas rates in the country here in Connecticut. And it really is based on the fact that we can't get the product. So I'd love to have that talk with you next year if you're amiable, Joe, thank you. And Rep Gresco? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, we, we usually have a, um, uh, a commissioner of, of DEEP give us a, uh, uh, um, a rundown of, of uh, priorities and uh, we can have a, uh, uh, I can request another um, uh, session where she could explain, uh, you know, why our uh, natural gas prices are, are so high, but that's going to be, you know, dovetailed into the whole idea of, of uh, uh, increasing our, our renewables. And then, uh, of course, you know, uh, what I think is going to come back next session is going to be the uh, the uh, uh, transportation climate initiative, uh, which uh, it, you know, it, you, I received a, um, quite a few uh, emails uh, regarding um, the majority of them uh, uh, positive, but it just uh, it, it just uh, didn't um, uh, make it um, uh, past uh, the, the deadline uh, because of the fact that, uh, like everyone else has said, we did a lot of heavy lifting. On a lot of bills, uh, uh, substantive bills uh, this year. So, so maybe next year we can we can uh, uh, tackle that. And and the fact that uh, the, the gas prices themselves, um, um, uh, the market rate uh, it was you know uh, going up um, and is over three dollars now. The timing of that couldn't be worse for something like TCI to be considered because most people. Uh, would you know uh, look at the the overall price and and uh, say to themselves, oh, I'm gonna now I'm gonna have to pay anywhere between a, a nickel to uh, a nine cents, uh, you know, more for for gas, even though um, uh, this nickel and and up to nine cents would be going to uh, uh, improving our uh, infrastructure for um, uh, renewables, uh, you know, the, the, the market is dictating that this is coming. Um, it may not be uh, in the next two to three years, but, uh, you know, most uh, car manufacturers are, are not going to be producing internal combustion engines uh, 
um, well, hopefully within my lifetime. So it, it's going to take uh, a, a lengthy um, a transition uh, to to uh, to um, uh, retrofit and and uh, uh, and prepare for that. And uh, I think uh, you know TCI is a is a good uh, first uh, step uh, for that. But um, uh, that's what I think is coming uh, for environmentally. So thank you. So so that means we should send the our negative emails to you right away. <laughs> uh, Did that uh, one the positive ones? Yeah, I, I you know I got all the positive. I got negative ones too. So so. Um, it's just that uh, you know uh, you can't turn on a dime uh, for something like this, and uh, you know uh, for here's the here's a for example, you know we wanted to adopt California's medium and heavy duty truck uh, emission standards, and one of the criticisms was that uh, we wouldn't be uh, uh, providing any subsidy uh, uh, for the individuals that wanted to s switch over. Um, uh, unlike California, and if if TCI had gone in or does go in, uh, some of that money would be used to assist with subsidies for individuals that are interested in getting out of their diesel trucks and going into something that's that's uh, electric. And that's the, the industry is telling us that's where they're going anyway. So we're just trying to follow the market. Uh, Joe. Uh, I, I look forward to further discussions on, listen, if we actually fix the road or a bridge, you could almost justify the, the paying a little money, but I don't know. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this morning and taking time out of your schedule. I know it's been a crazy session between Zoom calls and you guys actually being in session and on the floor in person. So again, thank you so much and hope you guys enjoy a non-campaign year and get to enjoy your summer. So kick it over back to Dan. Thanks, Ashley. And uh, just again, thank you uh, representatives for the hard work that you do. Uh, up in Hartford each session and enjoy the uh, summer break. I look forward to reconvening conversations in the fall ahead of the next session. And of course, I want to thank Kelly uh, and AT&T for their ongoing support uh, and all they do, uh, not just here in Greater Bridgeport, but throughout the region and Connecticut. Um, you know, fabulous partners. And uh, again, the, the work that CBIA has done um, this session, I think, is commendable just uh, for the, the unusual circumstances that we were in and keeping the business community informed and us uh, with the business council. So I appreciate everyone's time. I appreciate everyone's time on joining us this morning on the call. I know uh, it's a beautiful day out, and I wish you all a great rest of the week. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions or comments for the business council or for our representatives, please use, uh, use us. Uh, you can message me or call the office. We're always happy to uh, have some conversations. And if you're interested, our government relations uh, committee is always open um, and uh, available to you if you're interested in participating in those conversations. So look forward to uh, uh, seeing you all again in the fall. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.